Much love to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video and sorry for the wait everyone. In a day and age where almost everything you do is on the internet, whether you game with a bunch of friends or randoms or handle your business accounts and whatnot, it is crucial to keep your privacy and security intact because there's plenty of potential risks out there. Your ISP provider can see what you're doing and sell your data to advertising companies. Or hackers on public Wi-Fi can steal your personal info and open bank accounts in your name. Had that happen to a family member once and that was a pretty miserable time getting that fixed. ExpressVPN ensures your safety and it's really easy to use. Just open the app like so, click connect, and now you're protected. For less than $7 a month with a 30-day money-back guaranteed, ExpressVPN is the market-leading choice for VPN security. You get the fastest speeds compared to other VPN providers, server locations in over 94 countries giving you plenty to choose from, and support for just about every device. Windows, iOS, Android, Mac, Linux, or router, give us some time I'm sure my damn toaster could benefit from it as well. Now, I personally spent a lot of time online playing games and watching movies. And did you know with ExpressVPN, you can unblock services like Netflix to watch movies not available in your region? Something like all those Pokemon films and television series? Yeah, to be topical there. I didn't even know that was a thing until now. ExpressVPN helps keep my connection stable, masks my IP address to prevent security attacks, and encrypts my data to keep everything nice and safe from predatory websites. Take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three months free by clicking the link in the description below, expressvpn.com slash somecallmejohnny. Take back your privacy today with ExpressVPN. Why did all these games have to come out around the same time? Well, nothing happens until we get through today's subject. We're back to the main generation titles and now Pokemon was making their proper debut on the Nintendo DS. Not that Pokemon didn't already have a presence on the damn thing. The Pokemon Ranger series, puzzle games, need I say the Mystery Dungeon lineup, and a lot of you want me to look at this one specifically for reasons unknown. 2006 into 2007 would bring us Generation 4, Pokemon Diamond and Pokemon Pearl. And in 2009, we got the enhanced re-release Pokemon Platinum, which will be the version I'm covering. So this is where I decided to jump back into the Pokemon craze after initially ignoring Generation 3. Uh, around this time, I was attending the Arts Institute of Philadelphia, and my circle of friends there were really big into Pokemon. You know, they all, they all had their Nintendo DS's and a copy of Diamond or Pearl, and I wanted in on that fun while remembering, you know, all the nostalgic days of my Generation 1 and 2 binges. So I got myself a copy of Diamond about a few weeks before Platinum was released, so I stopped playing Diamond and picked up Platinum to start my Generation 4 experience proper. That said, I don't know every single difference between Platinum and the original releases. I know it's got the usual tweaks the enhanced versions bring. More Pokemon variety, gym leaders using slightly different teams, a better balancing gameplay, and more post-game content. All the standard stuff that makes Platinum the best of the bunch. Nostalgia for the previous gens was only a part of the reason why I jumped back in though. Pokemon was on the DS now, and this means for the first time ever, you could battle or trade with friends using a Wi-Fi connection. And this was a humongous deal at the time, and I'm pretty sure it was the biggest reason why a lot of folks jumped into Generation 4. Now for someone like me, I can get those trade evolutions like Alakazam or Gengar or Machamp without the need for a link cable or a wireless adapter. If you wanted a specific Pokemon to fill up your Pokedex, you can ask your friends across the country to see if they can lend you a hand. Or you could press your luck with the global traits. <laughs> oh, that was always such a mess. Be that as it may, in this year of 2019, the Nintendo DS Wi-Fi service has long been shut down. But you can still battle and trade with friends using a local wireless connection. Uh, but the likelihood of that happening in today's age is slim to none. But people are looking forward to Generation 8 now than Generation 4. With that in mind, the only thing I really won't be covering in this video is the underground area. Early in the adventure using this explorer kit, you can travel in these long underground passages with your friends and do shit together. Dig for treasure, set booby traps to screw around with each other, or build your secret base because I guess they really wanted to bring that back from Gen 3. From what I can tell, it's necessary if you want to complete the National Pokédex, as there are some items you can get here and only here, but it's not at all required to just finish the main story in postgame. There's plenty to do outside of this, believe me. But okay, so this is my jump back into Pokemon, but I haven't played Platinum in over 10 years, and I recall being irked about a couple of things back then. 
I remember the soundtrack being incredibly laid back and the battle themes being damn good. I recall the game being slow from a gameplay perspective and eight, eight HMs required to beat the game. Well, after playing Pokemon Coliseum and Gale of Darkness, Generation 4 is the flash by comparison, and the HM overload could be mitigated if you knew which Pokemon to carry. It's still obnoxious, however. Overall, I had some concerns going back. For the sake of my sanity, I used an emulator for this, just for the sake of fast forwarding through grinding, and that saved me a bunch of time. So shout outs to my pal Experiment T for hooking me up with the proper files to get things going. It's crazy to see just how far emulation has gone. I'm truly sorry for making you all wait for this one, but let's finally reach the tail end of this marathon with our jump into Generation 4. Our location this time is in the mountainous Sinnoh region. We're on the Nintendo DS now, so Game Freak was quick to incorporate a bunch more layering of polygons into the mix. Buildings and other elements are now 3D, and there's more emphasis on backgrounds and foregrounds to give the region a very layered feel. It's the most vertical region so far, which makes sense given where Sinnoh is located, for better or worse. Taking the helm as our protagonist this time are Lucas and Dawn, all depending on what gender you pick, of course. And there's really nothing special about these two. They're just kids who soon become assistants to Professor Rowan, this game's Pokemon professor, who wants the kids to go out there and help him learn more about Pokemon and such and such, etc, etc. This eventually leads them to traveling across the region, collecting gem badges and taking on the Pokemon League as usual. But this time it feels incredibly secondary. Like, I don't think our heroes really care about being the best this time. If it helps with the professor's research, then that's all that matters. No, if anything, the only one who's really concerned about being the best this time around is your longtime childhood friend and rival for this adventure, Barry, who is incredibly hyper, and that's it. Not much else to say about him. You fight him on occasion like you normally do in these games and he's off to another sugar injection. Doesn't even say goodbye to his mother before leaving on his journey, the little shit. But something sinister this way comes in the form of Cyrus, leader of Team Galactic, the most inconsequential band of criminals you'll ever meet. You run into this dude super early in your adventure, and originally he's very vague about stuff, spouting brief monologues about the imperfections of this world and what have you, but what are his true motives? What's he really want? Nobody knows, including the bunch of morons he's got under his belt. Team Galactic consists of a bunch of shallow, hot-headed morons that want nothing more than to impress Cyrus, but they're quick to whine, utterly clueless of their boss's agenda, and their mid to late 2000s internet speak comes off as extremely pathetic. I don't know, maybe it's a commentary of teenage society of the late 2000s? Maybe this was the writers trying to have their finger on the pulse of that generation, but overcompensated? I couldn't give you the straight answer. Either way, no matter how it is, they're clearly written to be a distraction while Cyrus goes about and does his own thing, and in that way it succeeds. It's just, wow, this concept has seen better days. Cyrus wants to harness the power of Pokemon to remake the world to his design. Yeah, he's he's quite homicidal like that, or omnicidal, I guess in this case, since he doesn't give a flying shit about humans or Pokemon. To complete his plan, he kidnaps the three late guardians of the Sinnoh region, and then uses their essence to create a means to summon Dialga and Palkia, masters of time and space respectfully. But before he can go through with gaining their powers, however the hell he was going to do that, they don't really elaborate on that part, out pops Giratina, the universe's failsafe should the balance between dimensions go haywire. Cyrus and the protagonist are then taken to the distortion world, where they hop around for a bit, and then our hero manages to calm Giratina down, and that's the end of Cyrus's scheme, I suppose. He claims that one day he'll make his dreams a reality, and then just leaves, never to face any repercussions for his actions. You know, wiping out the universe to remake it in your image isn't that bad of a crime in the world of Pokemon. <sighs> Holy shit. Then you go ahead and finish up your Pokemon adventure by collecting the rest of the gym badges and facing off against the Elite Four, ending with the battle against the champion of the Sinnoh region, <sighs> Cynthia. One of my favorite characters in this series just for the design alone, I know that's a pretty shallow reasoning for liking a character, but come on man, she rocks those clothes and her team is aces. She's also an avid Pokemon researcher and helps you along your journey, and also accompanies you in the distortion world to watch your back, so all around she means well, but she doesn't lift a single damn finger in your final battle against Cyrus. The universe is at stake, bitch, so help me out here! In the post game, we do get some resolution to the rest of Team Galactic shenanigans. With Cyrus gone to parts unknown, one of the commanders of the organization, Sharon, takes leadership and wants to disrupt the region for monetary gain, but to my bewilderment, this is the one time where the series actually acknowledges that police are a thing in this world and the man is incarcerated for his actions. This is the game to introduce Looker, an agent of the International Police. He's a little eccentric, but is dedicated to his job and by the end, gets the score on Team Galactic's arrest. On one hand, I'm bummed you never get to fight Sharon yourself, but on the other hand, yeah, fucking finally! Don't rely on the kid to do everything, you're an adult, do your fucking job! 
I don't know what to make of this plot completely. This is the first time in the Generation games where the Team Rocket plot, uh, to label it as something, takes precedence over the standard Pokemon League adventure. It's the most linear game in the series so far, and it's all for the sake of focusing on Team Galactic's endeavors. So, you know for all intents and purposes, this is the main story of the game. But then its resolution comes and goes, not much better than how Emerald ended its subplot with Team Aqua and Magma. You deal with the Distortion World stuff and come out like, whew, wasn't that something, right? And then things are back to normal. I don't think we're given enough of Cyrus to learn why he does what he does besides the usual This world is imperfect. What? You do learn from background text that he was once just another resident of the Sinnoh region and then over the years he wanted to remake the universe to his liking, you know, as we all do. But with no continued development, however, Cyrus doesn't go above the standard one-dimensional RPG villain. There aren't enough layers to get invested in his story, which is doubly disappointing considering this is a man who doesn't want to rob people of Pokemon for money or change the climate. He wants to remake the universe. Shit. On top of the usual Pokemon trappings of having a protagonist with no personal stakes in anything with no real growth, no interaction with anybody outside hitting yes or no in a choice box, we have a story that's more ingrained with the adventure, yes, but still misses the mark. Better than Emerald if we're just comparing the stakes, but still subpar for what I expect in an RPG. However, I do admire how the game attempts to do more with gym leaders. Don't get me wrong, they're all still, for the most part, another trainer to defeat to get another badge, but I feel they're given more personality and quirks than what we're used to at this point. They clearly have lives outside the gym, and even if it's for a brief moment, I like how the game highlights that. This is something I remember Generation 5 doing a better job with, but the seeds were clearly planted here, and kudos to Gen 4 for the attempt. But a new Pokemon for a new handheld, we got double the screens for utility, but with the DS being much more powerful than the Game Boy Advance, the whole package has been upgraded. 2D Pokemon adventures never looked this good, goes without saying. The sprites in both the overworld and battles are more detailed, battle effects have sleeker animations and spiffy particle effects, and environments are full of added detail that earlier games couldn't achieve. My only gripe is with, really, the scaling. Just about everything besides people and signs are three-dimensional objects, and the top-down angle is slightly skewed to put emphasis on the layered terrain, but the sprite scaling can look downright ugly at times, whether the camera is high up making you look so crunched, to when sprites are sort of caught in a flux and you end up with cases like this hiker here, who goes from a closed-eyed goofball to someone who's just been told his drink was poisoned. For all the good the DS did for detail, however, the frame rate was cut in half, with everything being capped to 30 frames per second this time. But capped frame rate is one thing, the game overall feels slower than previous generations. If you played those, you get that the moment the game begins. This is your default walking speed, and I was terrified. I remember the game being slow, but I'm like, oh god, it's worse than I remembered. But you do get the running shoes not long after, and then it's fine, and the bike is still an option as well. And learning from their mistakes from Gen 3, you can toggle the bike speeds at your leisure with the push of a button without needing to go to the store and swap bikes. The worst of it has to be saving your progress. I don't know the exact cause of it. I think, you know, finagling with your boxes inside the PC has something to do with it. But sometimes the game requires saving a lot of data to reference the game directly, and this can take damn near half a minute. You can make a sandwich with how long you have to wait. These are save times I used to seeing on a CD-ROM with a memory card, not on a cartridge. And I can't remember if Gen 5 had this problem as well, so I can't wait to see if that held over. Battles have also seen a slight decrease in snappiness. Attack animations and such are about the same as Gen 3, but now for some odd reason I will never understand the speed of which a Pokemon's HP drains when they're damaged or when you heal HP or when you gain experience has been significantly reduced and in the worst cases it is ridiculous how long it can take to watch a Pokemon faint with a damaging attack or with a one hit kill. I love Blissey but good god I know it varies from person to person and this may not bother you and again it's still way faster than Colosseum and Gale at Darkness but but eventually, it started driving me nuts and makes me glad I decided to use an emulator for the speed up feature. You'll be facing a lot of trainers this go around. Pokemon Platinum is so far the longest in the main generation titles. It can easily take you 25 plus hours just to finish the story, and there's a healthy number of things to do beyond that. I think the railroaded nature of story progression was key to making every area feel integral instead of just having a town for the sake of having a town or a route for the sake of having a route. There's something to do in all these locations, something to discover in every nook and cranny if you look hard enough. At different times of the day and week, yeah, Gen 4 brings back the day and night cycles from Gen 2, giving areas more significance than others or something else to do depending on what time of the day you decide to travel. As much as I think Gen 4 slowed things down, the Sinnoh region is one of the better worlds to explore I find, with set pieces that make it more memorable. Even though it's been some time since I last played this, I was surprised at how much I remembered going back. The Amity Square in Hearthome City where you're only allowed to bring in cute Pokemon for your visit, to which I say, yeah, this black belt has it right, this is racist. 
There's the old decrepit mansion in Eterna Forest where you can see the departed spirits of this young girl and her butler. You can also find a rodent possessing a TV if you visit the place at night. Unnerving, but leaves an impression, but not as unnerving as, as strange as this sounds, the church in Hearthome City. The folks inside seem a little out of it and no music plays while you're here. I know this game has a large emphasis on myths and legends, so it's likely just to serve as a backdrop to flesh out the world, but I always thought it odd. If there's one thing I can definitely say about Sinnoh is that it isn't boring, something I find very important to acknowledge in my case. Still, Sinnoh hits some familiar beats. There's a cycling road, there's a safari zone, there's a spooky ghost tower, you know, the things you can expect in these games, but I think for every instance of something old, there was something new, or at least refreshing enough to make the region more unique, although Generation 4 for the most part is still very routine. And for all I liked about Sinnoh, that's not to say I didn't get agitated, and yep, I'm talking about the HMs, eight of these fucking things, and they're all required to progress with the story. Along with the usual stuff, we got rock climb this time because Sinnoh was up in the mountains, okay, that makes sense. And then there's defog. Defog for a mountainous region, there are no fog lights in Sinnoh, was this really necessary? Mechanically, it's no different than how Flash was handled in earlier games, but now if you don't use it to clear up the area, that can affect your accuracy in battles, making them longer than they already can be. God, it sucks when I need at least two Pokemon strictly for HM usage. My first was Bidoof, because he can learn about three or four if I remember correctly. My second was Tropius, so that I can use Fly and Defog, as well as Cut and Rock Smash for when I need a Bidoof off my team for a bit. Good lord, this, this was overkill. I can't say enough how much I'm glad future games do away with this. Generation 4 is easily the worst of it, from what I can remember anyway. And listen, I'm not one to knock on Pokemon designs, everyone's got their favorites, so who am I to judge, but Sinnoh has a skunk with an ass for a face, and its cry sounds like it's ripping ass. <laughs> It's a little on the nose, don't you think? A lot of Generation 1 Pokemon got new evolutions for this game, a lot of them being trade evolutions, so get ready to have your inventory bloated with a lot of items you don't need if you're not interested in Pokedex completion. I'm pretty indifferent to most of them, but this gen did give me Rhyperior, Rhyhorn's new evolution that's been my favorite ground rock hybrid since. If you love Eevee, well those got two new evolutions if you level them up near certain rocks. A little bizarre, but now you can get the dedicated Grass Eevee Leafeon, or the coolest Ice Glacian, which has a neat design that's great, but not the one I wanted for this adventure, I wanted SBI. I'm sorry. My team was almost like my Gen 3 team, a little off kilter this time. I chose the Firestarter Chimchar because of course I did. It's another fire and fighting hybrid though, which for a while was kind of a fetish for Game Freak because the Torchic lineup from Gen 3 was also fire and fighting, and the Tepig lineup in Gen 5 to jump ahead a bit is also fire and fighting. It's a bit stifling in creativity. I actually wanted to ask you guys who I should choose as my starter for my Gen 5 recordings. Uh, so if you want to, you can vote in the poll on the card up top and you know, let me know who I should choose for my black and white adventure. Pokemon Coliseum really showed me how great Espeon was as a psychic type, so I went with her this time for my evolution, meaning once again I went with Gyarados as my angry as hell water type. After that, uh, whatever. I always did like the Luxio lineup visually. I'd still pick Raichu or Ampharos over them any day, but they were pretty beefy electric types that could take hits. I just wish they were a little faster. I usually like to get a normal type for all around coverage, but I got no Teddy Ursa this time to make into an Ursa Ring, so I went with a Baneri this time, which eventually becomes Lopunny because I like her speed and nothing else. Evolving a Baneri is a bit of a hassle since like Espeon, Baneri only evolves when you reach a high enough happiness value with it. But unlike Eevee, Baneri's initial happiness rating is a flat out zero, the only one of its kind to have that quirk I believe. This Pokemon hates your ass from the start, which you wouldn't think would be the case with that kind of cute design, but yeah man, she can't stand you. So enjoy the process of winning a lot of battles with her and running around in circles repeatedly just to get those values up. I also recommend giving her the Soothe Bow and giving her massages every day to really rack up the points. But as for the adventure, Platinum's very formulaic and doesn't change much from what Emerald introduced. There's still type matching to consider different Pokemon specializing in specific stat builds, and you have natures and abilities returning to make things more dynamic. However, I'd be remiss for not mentioning the biggest change Generation 4 brought to battles, and that's the physical special split, which I'll say now has more significance in the competitive scene, but nevertheless changed the landscape in Pokemon battles both competitively and casually. So in Pokemon, attacks can either be physical or special. If it's physical, its damage is based on the Pokemon's attack stat, with special being based on the Pokemon's special attack. Just to be very brief, Generation 4 reworked a lot of techniques and skills for the sake of balance and making some Pokemon better for it. For example, most Dark type Pokemon usually specialized in a high attack stat, but most Dark type moves were considered special, which worked off the special attack value to which most Dark type Pokemon didn't specialize in. With the split, most Dark type moves were changed to physical to better accommodate what most Dark type Pokemon were capable of. To give a little more of a personal example, I've always wanted to give my psychic type like Kadabra or Espeon something like Shadow Ball so that I have a good counter option for Ghost while taking advantage of my psychic Pokemon speed. However, until the Gen 4 split, Shadow Ball, the otherworldly ball of energy that came from the ethereal plane, 
was considered a physical move. And if you know your Kadabras and Espeon's attack values, that means it wasn't worth jack all. Come Gen 4, however, Shadow Ball was remade into a special move, and now my Psychic types have decent Ghost type coverage worth a damn. Again, like the additions of natures and abilities in Generation 3, uh, these changes have way more layers to them than I'm letting on, but you know how it works with this channel at this point. Very casual mindset. Uh, and I feel I'm not qualified, nor am I the authority on talking about how these like change the meta, e even though I know it changed the meta big time. But if you want something a little more comprehensive, then I can always recommend you something like Chugga Conroy's extensive Pokemon Platinum LP. It's a long one though, so make sure you put some time away for it if you're gonna watch it. It's good background noise, I find. With two screens at your disposal, you have more utility. Thankfully, the game doesn't decide to use both screens when you're traveling. I never liked that kind of incorporation for dual screens. One screen is used to show the game, while the other is used for gadgets and menus, just the way I like it. In battles, the bottom screen hosts the battle command so that it doesn't clutter the top screen, and you can use the touch screen to select commands if you want, though the D-pad and buttons are still viable. Soon you also get this Pokemon watch that lets you do several things. You can check the time of the day, you got this step counter that's useful for hatching eggs, you can check compatibility between Pokemon and your team if you want to breed them for later on. It's a lot of general purpose stuff to make your adventure more convenient. My favorite is the retooled dousing machine, which lets you find hidden items on the ground. With a touch of the screen, you can activate the radar and see if anything's close by. It's much more efficient than earlier games where you had to activate the item from a menu. And because it's more efficient, you can now find those items like amulet coins with ease, which doubles all your earnings from trainer battles, as long as you went with the Pokemon holding the item. I was drowning in money by endgame. I didn't know what to do with it besides invest in potions and the like. I'm a basic bitch. And I certainly wasn't going to waste money on making poffins. They brought contests back from Emerald, and it's about the same as before. You showcase your Pokemon in these beauty pageants and mini games for brownie points and decorations for your Pokemon. Instead of having them eat Pokeblocks to increase their beauty attributes, you feed them Poffins, which you can make by throwing berries into this mix and using the touch screen to stir up a batch and damage your screen. This is cute, but hardly what I call engaging. If I want to cook make-believe food, I'll go play Cooking Mama. As always, the adventure isn't quite over once you finish the Elite Four and defeat the champion. The Battle Frontier from Emerald makes its return, giving you a surplus of optional challenges and different stipulations. Like before, I didn't spend much time on this. I know I didn't cover the Frontier brains in my Emerald review, they're the leaders of the Battle Frontier, adding as a sort of secondary Elite Four. But fighting them required repeated participation in their specific Frontier with their stipulations, and I didn't find it necessary to recommend Emerald besides reviewing the main scenario. They're bragging rights, as is most post-game content I'm aware, but defeating the Frontier brains is very low on my priority list. For Platinum, that's pretty much the same thing, so again, I didn't find it necessary. The main story gives you plenty to do as is, and hey, if you love hunting down legendaries, whew, Platinum loves them just as much. Unfortunately, there's some that are just outright impossible to achieve nowadays without using a hacking device, since a select number of legendaries were only given away via special events during the game's prime. This included Regigigas, Manaphy, Darkrai, and uh, Shaman, I think that's how it's pronounced. There was also supposed to be an event that allowed you to capture an Arceus, the Pokemon equivalent to God. That's how far along we've come now. But that never came to be, strangely, and I don't know why. At the very least, starting with Gen 4, getting these special Pokemon was as easy as hooking up to the Wi-Fi and using the Mystery GIF option. You know, you no longer need to hook your cartridge up to this special device to get these exclusive Pokemon. And I do recall enjoying the ease of access when Platinum was all the rage back then. But even without these event exclusives, Platinum as is still has plenty of legendaries already in it. You have Dialga and Palkia, encounters I love for the music alone, and you have the mandatory encounter with Giratina. There's also Heat Trend, who you can find on Stark Mountain during post-game. But then you have the others, and... Ugh. Okay, of the three late guardians of Sinnoh, Yuxi and Azelf are cool because they just wait for you to arrive and then you get the chance to catch them. That's fine, I like that. But the third one, Mesprit, is another goddamn roaming legendary. And it doesn't stop there. There's also the returning legendary birds from Gen 1, who are also now roaming around the region. And then there's this one called Chrysalia, who's also a roamer. Jesus, come on. I mean, with the map marker app on your watch, these are easier to find than ever before, but no less tedious. And can we talk about Chrysalia for a second here? You can't even begin hunting this one down until you complete the Sinnoh Pokedex. And just for clarity, that just means the smaller regional Pokedex. And if you fought about every trainer in the region, you should do this naturally. I only had to find about three others before beginning this hunt. Afterwards, you meet with Professor Oak from Gen 1, who gives you the National Dex, a grim reminder that your true Pokemon Collectathon has only just begun, you pathetic fool. But with this, you head back to Canaleo City and find this small child trapped in a nightmare, and he can't wake up. You learn that the child's father has been feverishly looking for the Lunar Wing, the thing that'll help wake the kid up, and you agree to help the father by traveling to Full Moon Island. 
You find the thing in less than 15 seconds. I, did this man even try? Your kid is suffering. You know the item you need is on this island. It's not a large island at all. And he didn't think to- What are you fucking stupid? But I feel it bears repeating that Platinum does give you a lot to do. And this is only a small part of it. It's quite a beefy standard Pokemon adventure. And one, considering it's longer than normal length, doesn't overstay its welcome. But I should also again emphasize standard Pokemon adventure because besides the physical special split, that means more for the competitive scene, really. This gen mechanically and structurally is just a better looking Gen 3. It's the tried and true Pokemon formula down to its most basic ingredients. It is a very safe game that knows what it wants to do and what it wanted to avoid and sticks with it, which is not a bad thing, mind you, but easier to notice when you marathon these games. I'm glad to say my revisit was not a waste of time and it's better than I remembered, but let's just say I wouldn't be surprised if I put this down for another 10 years. Platinum is a great Pokemon game, but not my preferred Gen 4 experience. It's still a little too slow for my liking. Maybe with my growing age, I've grown a little more impatient. But if I'm revisiting Gen 4 in any capacity today, it's with Heart Gold and Soul Silver, the Gen 2 remakes. Now, don't get me wrong, these are just as slow as Platinum, but I love Johto. I love everything in Johto. And I know that's not really fair to say there's clearly a bias there, and I'll happily admit to that. But I would recommend these over Diamond Pro or Platinum any day. But if you're gonna play Platinum, you're at the very least getting a solid RPG. But for the next generation, the final generation for this marathon was released in two parts. I don't know why, besides money, obviously, but instead of giving us the usual enhanced re-release for a new game, they gave us a game, then gave us a direct sequel to the game on the same handheld, Pokemon Black and White 1 and 2. Uh, but we're going to be starting with Black and White 1 next time for our Generation 5 adventures, so uh, that's what we're going for next time in the Pokemon Marathon, and then afterwards we will finally end things with uh, Black and White 1 and 2. And if I have time, then, you know, <laughs> we'll see if I can fit in a mystery dungeon game somewhere in there. I did, uh, sincerely did get a lot of requests for this one. And uh, we'll see if I can get Pokemon Puzzle League somewhere along the line, too. Along with all the other damn games that I have to look at. Uh, God, where to start? Crash Team Racing, Nitro Fuel, Team Sonic Racing, Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night, Super Mario Maker 2. A few other things I'm going to look on. Ah!